Rodent Rampage, Roy's using a new thermal scope and rangefinder on Squirrel, Rat and Fox. Smooth gun carriage, I look at some great British craftsmanship. Plus the art of the game cart, Paul shows us how to present the birds. And we have the last of Wayne's series with the catapult, this time it's Great Balls of Firepower. Once again we have news, we have hunting YouTube, welcome to Field Sports Britain. We already know that thermal optics are a pest control game changer. Seeing in the dark is one thing, range finding in the dark is another. Not anymore, Pulsar has just released the Trail LRF. The trail that we were using before when we did the waste transfer station didn't have the built-in rangefinder. So if you look just there, you've got the rangefinder built in on the side and it's just a, a quick touch of the button at the front to put it into rangefinder mode, it comes up with a little square, you press it again and then it flicks up your range and then goes back to your crosshairs and it's as quick and simple as that. To test the range finding capabilities of this new Pulsar, Roy has chosen the most range sensitive rifle in his safe, the FX Impact. He has already spent an afternoon on the squirrels. They're seriously equipped little critters, I mean they really have got, I mean you look how long those teeth are on the lower jaw. And you've got the, the chisel teeth on the top there. Incredibly strong as well. I mean, they are just little muscle houses. Well, we had a good fun afternoon out on the squirrels. I just really wanted to find out what it was going to be like using the, uh, the new LRF. So it's got the, the laser rangefinder in it, um, combined with the, uh, the FX impact. And it, it works superbly well. I'm really happy with seven squirrels you know, for a couple of hours bimbling around in the woods. Um, unfortunately, David wasn't there for that one, so we filmed most of it filming through the, uh, the scope um, and through the accolade as well, so through the, the thermal spotter. Just having that ability when you're using thermal or night vision um, to be able to get an exact range is such a benefit. It is, it is one of the downfalls I've found with using any thermal or, or night vision equipment is, is always guessing your range slightly because you're never quite 100% sure. Um, whereas this takes all of the guesswork out of it. We'll hopefully run through a, a, a scenario where we can ping something, uh, it'll come up with the range, um, we know exactly how far it is then, and then we're able to take the shot that we want and, and hit the exact place on the target they're after. As we head to Rat Central, Charlie on the Accolade Thermal Spotter spots a fox in the field. This could be interesting. We've got a fox sitting out in the paddock just behind there. Obviously we're using an FAC air rifle. I really wouldn't want to shoot it much past 30, 40 yards. So we're going to just have a creep and just see if we can get a little bit closer to it. Have a bit of a squeak and see if we can get any interest. Okay, so it's 98 metres away at the moment. So obviously if we were using a centre fire, we'd have no issue. But there's no way of taking a shot like that at a fox so with an air rifle. So. We'll have a squeak and see if he wants to come in a bit. A few years ago we filmed Roy shooting fox heads. He wanted to find out if he'd be confident using the 30 cal FX Boss to take a fox. He was happy then and he's happy now that this FAC Impact will do the job at a sensible range. Thankfully we have the kit to make that decision. Yeah, rifle. I mean, we have done 
testing on it before, um, and we, we do know these are powerful enough to, to penetrate the skull if you get exactly the right shot on them. Um, but as I say, it just wasn't worth taking a, a marginal or a chancy shot on that. So unfortunately, I think it's uh, foxes are off the menu now, and we'll uh, start concentrating on the rodents again. So fingers crossed, we haven't upset the rookies. This lot have nested in the bottom of one of his aviaries. Again, the fence is an issue, so unless it gets clear, we have to wait until that rat is as close to the wire as possible. It was really interesting because David was looking with the camera with the IR and he just couldn't pick up either of those two very well at all. And the remarkable thing was I could see a heat signature at the back but I couldn't work out what it was and it stayed very still but I didn't want to shoot until I knew exactly what it was and we'd identified it. And then we saw a heat signature coming from a hole and then I looked at it and you could just see the warmth emitting from it and then you just saw a nose emerge and then the rat went along the back and then came back and then worked his way back up that hole and just stuck his hand out and gave us a shot and then the other heat signature turned out to be another rat as well and I just shot that as it went to come back in the hole as well so yeah, I mean absolutely phenomenal it's uh, a little bit overkill for this job but again it's not difficult uh, yeah I can put it on the air rifle zero in a couple of minutes um, and then tomorrow I can put it back on the centre of fire and we can take it foxing so it, yeah it just works very very well for this sort of game and we ranged those foxes at different ranges afterwards when they'd gone back out into the fields um, and it was precise so we were I think they were back out at about 170 meters out there the closest we got them um, was the 60 or 61 meters so it just takes out all of the doubt you know exactly where you are you know what your ranges are um, and it just reassures you that you can take that shot knowing exactly where you are it's not a massive bag but it shows just how flexible the trail LRF can be for more information, go to thomasjacks.co.uk. Thank you, Roy. And if you want to see ratting on an industrial scale, click on the eye symbol top right to see Roy's waste transfer piece from last year. Now from waste transfer to, well, waste of space, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. <laughs> This is Field Sports Channel News. Roy Lupton has made it onto British TV show QI. Roy's video of the famous hat of love, the hat he uses to collect semen from his male hawks, was the subject of one of the questions on the popular UK show. Irish radio show hosts have attacked a caller after he revealed he was a hunter. The consumer watchdog show Liveline encourages callers to complain about poor service. When a caller called Frank said he'd lost 100 bullets worth 700 euros on an Air France flight to Zimbabwe, instead of trying to help him out, the radio show hosts attacked him and demanded he defend trophy hunting. Frank gave a spirited defensive hunting, but the RTE1 presenters were against him thanks to Finian Carton for sending in the story. A hen harrier that Scottish aunties said had been killed by gamekeepers has been found alive and well. Gamekeepers now want a crackdown on satellite tagging after the RSPB spotted the bird in Perthshire. The RSPB said nothing about spotting it alive, 
even though the organisation made a great deal of reporting its apparent disappearance in 2018. In addition, a farmer found a dead sea eagle with a tag that had failed several weeks previously and was already on a list of birds missing, believed persecuted. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association now wants the satellite tagging of birds to be licensed by the Scottish Government and some gamekeepers claim that cumbersome tags are what's killing the hen harriers in the first place. A doctor's surgery in Scotland is trying to exclude gun owners from its patient list. Lathe surgery now charges £200 to endorse a shotgun or firearms application because it says its doctors are conscientious objectors to legal gun ownership. A group of antis are trying to stop Sainsbury's from culling feral pigeons. London Wildlife Protection posted the name and telephone number of the manager of a Sainsbury's supermarket in Kent after revealing that the store culls fell pigeons for hygiene reasons. Staying with animal rights and pigeons, some antis are taking seriously a spoof posting on Facebook about protecting clay pigeons. A page called The World Is Not PC Enough says that callous hunters are breeding clay-coloured pigeons to be released by a medieval catapult into the air and shot out of the sky. It posted these two pictures to support its claims. So antis think this is real. Blaza has announced new additions to its R8 rifle range in 2019. Launched at the Yachton Hun Show in Dortmund this week, Blaza has brought out a 2.2 rimfire conversion kit for your R8, including barrel, bolt head and magazine insert, which holds six shells. Blaza is also showing off its R8 Ultimate Rifle with thumbhole stock and this one with barrel and built-in moderator. Derbyshire Rural Crime arrested three poachers last week. Thanks to the actions of a gamekeeper, its armed response unit arrested three men and seized two air weapons and 21 headless pheasants and a rabbit. The police posted the result on its Facebook page, prompting a comment from an auntie suggesting it arrest the royal family for going shooting, to which Derbyshire Constabulary posted this gif. A police force has warned the general public not to believe everything they see and read about fox hunting on social media. Cheshire Police says that frequently video footage does not reflect the full scenario. In a carefully worded statement, Cheshire Police revealed how the propaganda war waged by anti-hunt activists and huntsmen and women on websites like Facebook is often based on inaccurate information. This move comes after Cheshire hunt saboteurs posted edited video footage online of violence against a protester during a hunt. But after detectives saw the entire clip and wider context, they decided not to pursue prosecutions. And to say they feel alienated. Denmark feels it can keep out African swine fever by building a wall. First, there was Australia's rabbit-proof fence. Then Donald Trump's Mexican-proof wall. Now Denmark is building a 42-mile fence along its border with Germany in order to keep out wild boars which authorities say threaten to bring disease to Danish pig farms. And finally, Chris Packham has outraged his neighbours by calling for a ban of livestock in the New Forest. Now the New Forest commoners are fighting back under the hashtag, hashtag Real New Forest. On their website, they point out the porkies in Packham's claims against them, including this claim that there are 13,000 head of livestock grazing the New Forest. His claim that the New Forest is being drained and his claim that the New Forest ponies are starving. Thanks to Phil Monkton for sending in the story. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now I've been off to see a man who makes gun cabinets for the back of your car, but not just any gun cabinets. It's the soft clothes that everyone seems to like. No matter what you do with the box, the soft clothes is the seems to be the highlight of it, which is fantastic. <laughs> it's American black walnut. So the, the box is made from American black and the front is a, an American black burr. And the burr is made up of four segments pieced together to, to make the one. So you can see the book match folds open and open again. The, the whole thing is um, laminated uh, out of about six sections. And the reason it's laminated is to get stability. With a lot of um, larger boards and larger materials, as soon as you make it from a solid piece of timber, you're likely to have movement, and especially in a box which is exposed to you know various um, humidities. It will get damp, it will get wet. Uh, movement is the last thing you want as the box just won't open. So for, for me, I'm a bespoke uh, furniture maker um, by trade. 
way the gun market is something which I'm, I'm moving into and I wanted to show off uh, my craftsmanship as opposed to just creating a box which this, this, this piece is um, form over function really it's designed to, to catch the eye um, and really add a bit of interest to the vehicle. I now have an idea in my head of what I think is the perfect box. So for me, I wanted 10 flutes, I wanted 10 tumblers, um, storage for champagne and a few other drinks. And most of the boxes I build, the guns are broken down and strapped inside of a drawer. Now for me, I, I think that looks great and visually it's fantastic, but I wanted a box where I could break my gun down and then take it back into the house, clean it up without having to put it together, pull it apart every time. You know, if I was going for dinner, this box locks up, I can take the box away and put it into um, into the safe in the, into the, in the hotel or bring it with me to the restaurant in, in components. Um, and so for me, the idea of having a box in the back which, had, which takes a pair of broken down guns was the perfect situation. So as long as we have the 10, 10 of each glass, the drinks, some general accessory storage in the front, which as you can see, isn't filled up, but for, for headphones, glasses, anything else which you might have, and, and the gun, we, we, we have it all in there, really. Somebody did call shooting an armed drinks party, didn't they? It pretty much is, yeah. It's, um, that's the, no matter what, any of the boxes I do, the hospitality is the most um, exciting point for, for a lot of people. And the boxes um, do also go for people that, um, that, that race, so for the open boot days, at, um, you know the horse races people love these boxes so without the um, guns in the back we do the, the insides are all interchangeable so if you were um, people do have them for picnic sets for, for going for lunches for you know lunch out in the park so it's nice to be able to use the box all year round as well as just the shooting season being a cabinet maker and back in his workshop Blake also has tips for how to look after the wood on your gun stock. Depending on the how bad the finish is on your gun, but the gun that I've got today, my gun is pretty good. It's just had a few scratches from the odd the odd hedgerow that um, we've jumped through. So hopefully a 320 grit. If it is in a much worse condition, you need to start at something like a 120, just gently, and then working down through 120, 150, 180. But the main thing with sand is to make sure that you use, you work through those grits in small increments. Basically using every grit that you've got to get that finish. If you jump from, say, a 120 to a 180 the 180 won't sand out the scratches you've had because the 320 is the sandpaper that's the highest grit and then with the four um, 40 wire wall the most important thing to do is to make sure that you do use that sanding block in the first instance and that you don't uh, leave an uneven finish um, you want to make sure that there's no grease on the gun so the gun will pick up obviously a lot of grease and oil from from you know the human hand you see it anywhere in a car where you've been using it for a period of time it picks up that grease and on the gun stock you probably wouldn't necessarily see it and if you didn't remove all of that grease the finish wouldn't then take to the existing to, to the stock itself um, it would lift and then the finishes can bubble and crack and um, the other really important thing to do with the oil is to make sure you apply a thin layer so build up so on the gun boxes they're sort of between six and eight coats depending on it could be five coats if the finish is going well but the main thing is to make sure you apply a thin layer after thin layer after thin layer because if you apply a thick layer especially with an oil it will um you'll be able to sort of drag your finger through the lines in it. It's really important that you do a thin layer at a time. Don't be disgruntled if at the first coat it's not necessarily going the right way. Just rub it back again gently and apply another finish. Um, the nice thing with an old finish is it's not the end of the world if the finish doesn't go right. Leave it, make sure it dries and cut it back and work it through again. Um, obviously mask up all of the metalwork on the gun because usually with metalwork you can then clean it off afterwards if there is any overspill of oil. Make sure you use um, a high quality masking tape, something that doesn't allow what they call bleed through. So a cheap tape, the oil will bleed through the masking tape. So something everyone knows, frog tape, which is what you use, you know, in your de decorating your home, you use the big green masking tape. It's worth spending a couple of pounds on some masking tape because it will protect the rest of your gun. Now, oil is better than something like a varnish or a lacquer because the lacquer will sit on top of the wood as opposed to penetrating. It never really feeds it. The wood inside is still allowed to expand and contract and move. Um, it just seals it up. It's called Rubio Monocoat. The abrasive pads, so these are, these are the pads that we use and they're used as a floor polishing pad. So they're, they're a, like a, a plastic um, webbing I guess and basically the idea is they they have a texture so they can work the oil into the wood and make sure the oil is penetrated properly as opposed to just with a rag which it just you're polishing off the oil before it's had a chance to settle in this actually allows the oil to work in and then you buff it off afterwards so with a cotton rag and make sure it's a, a clean lint free cotton rag otherwise the lint will sit on the oil finish afterwards and then you try and get it off and then the finish is, is affected. Just a, yeah, a pair of cotton underpants would do the job really, but uh, you know, try and use something white so that, that you can easily see the fibers afterwards. The darker colors you do tend to, you, you, you tend to miss.
Blake's gun cabinets are not cheap. They start at £4,000 and the most expensive one he made costs more than £10,000. But they are lovely. If you want to see more of them, have a look at his website, blakebespokefurniture.com. Thank you, Blake. Now, we are going to film some more with Wayne Martin about catapults, but for the time being, here's the last in his current series, and it's balls, lead and steel balls. <laughs> get on him, get on him, Crow. <laughs> what balls were we using today, then, Wayne? Today we've been using a mix of nine and a half mil steel and nine mil lead. Yeah. Um, I, I, can't, I use between the two. Um, obviously, the closer the shot, I'm, I prefer to use steel because it's, it's a flatter, yeah, yeah. faster uh, ball. But at longer range, I prefer to have a bit of weight behind the shot just in case you don't place the shot perfectly. Yeah. More chance for a clean kill. So what was you shooting the squirrel with today? Uh, lead. Was it? In fact, I think I shot one with lead and one with um, steel. Yeah. Yeah. So where would you use yeah. those? I wouldn't use them. You wouldn't. No. These are eight mil steels. Uh, yeah. They're sort of they're, tar they're target loads. You know, a lot, a lot of people now, guys that shoot targets all the time, like I'm saying, they, they use light bands, small balls for better accuracy. You know, it's all right. all about the accuracy. They don't, they don't sort of care about power really. You know, it's just literally about hitting them small targets. Right. So what about this size? Yeah, moving up. They're sort of ten mil. Um, yeah. Yeah. They, they still get used. Ten or twelve mil, something like they are. They still get used. They're not, you know, not too bad. I don't use them. I say I don't go any larger than that really. I've... So these are eight. No, these are nine and a half mil these steel. And they're, they're nine mil lead. Yeah. They're ten mil lead. Right, okay. I don't tend to use these so much now because I've switched back to the nine mil, which I find just just it's slightly faster. So obviously that they're a flat trajectory I over distance. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's not these ones here. These are for the old catapults. Yeah, they? Christ. These are things from when I was a kid. Yeah. This is what we would use from this. You yeah. know, it, it was never about placing the shot. It was always about just uh, hitting it. Hitting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it really was. You know, you hit something with that, it's uh, it's not going far. Yeah, no, no, you know. Nah. So things have got a bit more refined, Wayne. Is that what we're saying? A hell of a lot more refined. So you know, to say a catapult is complex sounds a bit crude, but it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's become it's become it's become a science. You know, it really has. Why a nine, not a ten? You know, it's, you're being that specific about it? Yeah, well, I mean, if you think this probably, this weighs about four grams, this one weighs about five grams. So you've increased its weight by 25%. And 25% is a hell of a lot of weight increase. Although it's only, they're only small, coming from a band like this, you know, you add 25% yeah. more work to it, it's going to have 25% more drop probably. Yeah. You know, so you go from a four inch holdover to a six inch holdover. Thank you, Wayne. Next up, Modern Gamekeeper with Paul Childerly. <laughs> One of the main things is, is respect your quarry. One, it's obviously you're respecting what you're shooting, and then play the other side of it, you've got to eat it. So right from putting it down, the husbandry right way through, the, the correct feeding, so you've got a good strong bird, then you had the sport out of it, and then you've got the bird for the table, um, which obviously is, a, is a, a really key thing to the, to the job. These are partridges that are going into November now, so really good strong birds, plump birds, personally, my favourite game meat. They're, they're absolutely brilliant. One each on the plate. And what I do is I normally, this time of year, I start sneaking a couple in my pocket. When I'm at the back of the guns, I start hand plucking it and I pluck it right through the wing and I fold the wings back properly and I do it all and then I gut it that night and then I keep that for the Sunday lunch. And we have one each, my, myself and my wife. And um, my little lad also has a share of it. And then sometimes I end up having to have the chicken that he's got and, I'm, and he has the partridge. Different people tie them different ways but um, a lot more people tie them like this nowadays because as they go over the bars the birds are separated whereas the olden days they used to tie the birds together neck on neck and then obviously that those birds would have a chance of heating up but now we tie them separately the hung apart separately so the air can go through to cool the birds down nicely even though we're, we're shooting these, we're thinking for the table. We're looking to get the best game to the plate, basically. Here, Duke, come on. Good boy, good boy. Here. So this is how we tie ours up. 
basic string, loop it together, one head in, over the top, second head in, and then you've got them presented nicely, and then across the bars. Today's a cool day, so it's not a problem, but if any, any warm days, they go straight back to the chiller, hung up in the chiller. But yeah, it's, it's about doing the whole thing, you know, seeing what you shot, respecting what you shot, and enjoying what you shot. Now from pheasants to the rest of the world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. And YouTube is big on bird shooting this week. Owen from Service UK has just put up this film of him walked up grouse shooting in central Perthshire back in September. With grouse numbers low last season, guns are picking their birds and honouring pairs. They still end up with a decent bag. It's been a strange year for woodcock. Not bad like last year, but patchy, with good numbers reported in some areas. Here is Givendale Spaniel's woodcock shooting video over Givendale Jack and testing out his new aim cam. Staying on winged game, South Somerset Ferreters is out after pheasants, an end of season beaters day with end bag 86 pheasants and two pigeons. Want to know about this year's air gun launches? Giles Barry of the Air Gun Gear Show brings out his pellet pushers report from SHOT Show 2019. The Catapult Show episode 2 with Gamekeeper John is out. He covers a catapult competition in South Wales, new kit on the market and offers tips on building your own slingshot. Waikaroo Moana is once again after fallow deer in New Zealand, two meat hunts with a 22-250. With the end of the the season in sight, Outdoor Limits from Nebraska, USA is on a duck and goose hunt. And finally, the squirrels on Outdoor Boys property have done more than $3,000 US dollars worth of damage by chewing holes in a garage door, two cars and a boat. That's four reasons this film is called Catch, Clean and Cook Squirrel, Squirrel Hunting, Snaring, Cleaning, Skinning and Recipes. That's it for this week, I've put all these films into a playlist for you, click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top 8, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain, it's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>